Hola, this is you from the Tech Cave, and today we're going to understand caching. <laughs> Let's say this is you working at a library. Your job is to respond to students' requests about books they need for their next assignment. The library is really big, and the process of finding the book, bringing it to the student, and returning it to its right place is really exhausting and time-consuming. But what you gonna do? You're broke and you really need the few pennies they pay you. As students borrow books, you notice that there are quite a few books that are used frequently and you decide to put them close to your desk in a bookshelf. Let's call it the fast retrieval bookshelf. Whenever someone requests one of those frequently used resources, you are able to fulfill the order in no time. Magnifique. Yeah, that was French. Now, it seems that what is happening on the computing world in general and in the web sphere specifically is not that different from what is happening in the library. Frequently requested resources are increasing, the human race are evolving into these angry species that cannot tolerate delays, and databases cannot keep up and are growing tired. This means fast retrieval of data is no longer nice to have, it's a must have. Luckily for us, we have something similar to the library technique in the software world. Can you guess? The fast retrieval bookshelf technique we used in the library is called caching in the digital world. Great! So caching is one way modern web applications and computing systems solve performance degradation issues. Web applications have to contend with millions of users and software consumes data more than ever before. Even millisecond delays can cause issues. And data is growing complex and the standard data store cannot deal with this on its own. So what do we do? We need a way to deliver data and respond to requests with minimal delays. All right, now that we have a rough idea about the problem and what the solution is generally, the question is, what is the bookshelf in this case? In other words, what is the location where we want to keep resources closed for retrieval? The answer is a caching layer. That is to say, any location that could be used to quickly retrieve results. Retrieving results and resources from a caching layer could be way faster than getting them from the main source. And one common way to implement caching is using in-memory data stores. Alright, what the heck is an in-memory store? It's just a type of RAM, don't panic. And why RAM? Because it's way faster when it comes to read-write operations compared to other types of storage. Instead of retrieving resources from the main database in the disk drive, we use a fast retrieval place to store frequently used resources so that they can be served quickly. And that place is the RAM. Because as we said, RAMs have super fast I.O. operations. Of course, to achieve this, we need really large in size and advanced in memory stores. Not the 8 gigabyte RAM you have on your obsolete low performing machine. Alright, so caching is using the computer's main memory or RAM to efficiently manage frequently used data. Speed and performance of data retrieval and, and even manipulation as we'll see is increased by eliminating or minimizing the need to constantly perform repeated computations or accessing the slower disk storage layer. And this technique not only improves performance but also improves the scalability and availability of applications. Amazing! And there is more by the way. Caching could be applied to different use cases, which makes it a really powerful and important feature in all types of systems. You can find caching implemented in databases to speed up read and write operations in web applications, both in the server side, such as caching resource intensive computations, queries, etc., and in the client side as well, such as caching static resources, etc. We could also find it in operating systems such as CPU caches to solve the imbalance between the CPU computing speed and memory data reading. And finally, we can find it in networking as well such as DNS caches, CDNs, etc. Sweet! So, we've seen that there are different use cases for caching, right? And of course, the details and specifics differ from use case to use case, but the basic idea is the same. And in this video, I'm not going to talk about low-level caching because it's beyond the scope of this video, so I'm just going to focus here on the web realm. Caching could be applied throughout the web layers from end to end, from clients to databases. It could be used in client-side through offline mode using the cache API and the indexed API. These two techniques are used for advanced advanced client-side caching. If you want something simpler, you can go with the web storage API. HTTP cache headers are also used to cache requests and responses. And if you want to know more, documentations are your best friend. And of course, implementation details are browser and application specific. The next layer in which we find caching is DNS lookups. DNS servers are used for this purpose to speed up this process. And by the way, you can visit my video lesson about DNS to learn more about it. DNS local caches in your computer and your ISP 
servers are used for this as well. Moving towards the server side, caching could be found in session management as well, and also to retrieve web resources from servers through centralized session management data stores. Other types of technologies that are used for this purpose are key value stores, CDNs, reverse proxies, etc. Application backends also cache data and computations to accelerate performance and achieve fast retrieval. And finally, we find caching at a database layer using in-memory stores as adjacent data access layers to the database for not only read requests but also write operations. That is so cool! Nah, uh, let's go back to the library story and we'll see. The bookshelf we placed close to the library and helped a lot in terms of efficiency and response time. But over time, it turned out that we can't just implement the bookshelf technique and be happy with it. Why? Because frequently used books started to grow and it seems that the bookshelf needs to grow as well. But if we keep scaling the bookshelf without any limits, we might come across another problem. So we need to find a way to replace, say, or make room for items according to some rule. Like removing the least recently used books from the bookshelf, for instance. This situation opens our eyes to similar problems in caching. When we decide to implement caching, we first need to consider quite a few important things. First, the cache size. Determining how much caching you need will be the foundation for other decisions such as whether to choose local in-memory caching or using an external service for that. It will also determine the technology that will work best for your use case. The second consideration is populating the cache. When you first implement caching, how will you go about populating the cache? Are you going to let users' requests guide you? This means whenever a request is sent, it hits the cache first. If it finds it there, the user will get the response faster. Otherwise, the result will come from the data source or the server gets stored in the cache after the user receives the reply. Or are you going to populate it up front with the values you choose? All right, congratulations, you've just learned about the two most common techniques of populating the cache, upfront population and lazy population. And finally, you need to think about cache management, which involves the eviction policy and synchronization with the main data source. The eviction policy simply means what is the strategy used to remove data and replace it with new items. The cache capacity is limited and we need a way to manage this. And to solve this problem, there are some common strategies, but you can define your rules and implement them the way you desire. Surely an intuitive approach is to follow the least frequently used technique. You essentially remove the least frequently used item in the cache. Other strategies such as last recently used are also common. And you can also follow a time-based strategy. It all depends on the type of data and the system requirements. Now, when we talk about synchronization, on the other hand, we are talking about making sure data doesn't grow inconsistent with the source over time and making sure the cache is in sync with the remote system needs careful thought. How tolerant the system and your users are with stale data. For this reason, an expiration policy needs to be implemented to update cache data. Now, for developers, understanding the idea behind caching is more important than the technology itself. Because caching could be implemented in many ways, as we've seen, on different levels in the system and according to different rules. Of course, when it comes to caching technologies, there are two main types, key value stores and fully indexed caching. Of course, developers prefer key value stores such as Redis and Memcached because they are easy and straightforward to implement, but more advanced systems may need advanced indexing mechanisms. So a fully indexed in-memory cache that has SQL support might be the right solution. All right, and it's important to note that caching has security implications. Considering the security aspect of cache data is really important. Stale data and weak encryption will open the door for attackers to take advantage of that. Caching is great for sure, but if the cost of running a caching layer is not worth it, then not implementing it would be the wise thing to do. Now, your next step if you want to implement caching is to determine where you want to implement it. In the client side, the server side, in both. Then you try to find the right technology for your use case. Open up the documentation and good luck. I hope you enjoyed this video and learned something new. Till the next video, stay fine and stay tuned.